friends, we really, really, really need to discuss descriptive statistics because I'm starting to get extremely frustrated for feeling that no one knows how the fresh fuck to understand descriptives. And as such, skeptic TM community, this video goes out to you. You're welcome. It's yours. You seriously should understand this shit if you're going to report on it. But luckily, guess what? Descriptives are very simple. Descriptive statistics merely describe what data look like, essentially, and are the building blocks of more complex inferential statistical analysis. When we will get into statistical analysis on the inferential level. Specifically, I will be talking about regressions and how to understand model fit. I'm starting to think that this is such a clusterfuck because we're talking about people not seemingly being able to understand correlations and as such definitely not being able to understand regression models. That's uh, confusing to me because I thought these were the things that a lot of us learned in high school, but apparently not. Anyway, I'm not trying to be highfalutin asshole statistical person here. I'm actually just trying to disseminate information freely. And as such, we need to start with descriptive statistics because descriptives are important to understand as with any other building block upon which more difficult concepts are founded. Descriptive statistics convey the most basic information about a set of data collected from a group of individuals. I'm going to state that here, folks, so that you do understand this is the most simplistic analysis of data. As such, if you ever see someone implying that these levels of data are somehow too complicated to get into detail with for the average viewer, because <laughs> I'm seeing that, understand that descriptives are without question the most simplistic level of analysis. In other words, if someone is telling you that you can't understand the data that he or she is describing, well then here's your lesson, and afterwards you should not only be able to understand and read these data, but also ask logical questions related to these basic terms, to pose questions and seek answers. I'm going to start with even basic statistics and just wait and see how far I'm going to take this bullshit. I'm going to start here with the basics because I will take it all the way up to ANOVAs and MANOVAs and that kind of shit. See friends, I think that kind of terrifies some people who throw around meaningless terms and misinterpretations of data, which I'm seeing so commonly happening, because I don't think they know how to respond to this kind of shit. And that's kind of the reason I started my channel, is because I think that college is extremely overpriced and I don't think people should have to pay for it in the way that they do. As such, yeah, here, <laughs> here's an introduction to descriptive statistics. I mean, I see this so commonly, not just within the legacy media, but without. In that they'll just throw out statistics and say, oh, the science shows, the numbers show, the numbers indicate. Uh, that's meaningless. If you can't understand for yourself, if you don't understand how to read the data yourself, then you're going to be drawn into these same fallacies. As such, I want to help you familiarize yourself with the reality of statistics, how to read research, how to refute bullshit when you see it. And uh, if I think I can manage to do that, the people in the legacy media and without will have no power over you, no power to mislead you. The greatest thing I could hope to possibly do. Let's first assess a couple of terms that I'm going to be using, the first being the term data set, which simply is a culmination of data that are collected through, for example, a survey type analysis, as we examined in the first episode of How Do I Social Science, but really I should be more clear, I'm not specifically talking about social science, this is really more of a series of How Do I Statistics. Anyway, data set. A data set is a large number of people who have responded to a survey for, for instance, so that social scientists can assess their responses, or any kind of scientist really. The number of cases in a data set are represented by the symbol N. Much of what we talk about when we talk about descriptive statistics are the measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and mode that describe a single data set. The arithmetic mean is the average in the set and is represented by the symbol X. Of descriptives, the mean is pretty much the most useful and most commonly reported on numeral, but also it is the most volatile, in that the mean is dependent on every single number in the data set. Changing a single number in the set will change the mean. The median represents a numerical value in the data set that is closest to the middle of the total group of numbers. That is, if I have between 1 and 100, 50 is the median. Finally, the mode is the numerical value value that occurs most frequently. I would suppose that most of my viewers are familiar with these very elementary terms. Again, I think we mostly learn them in elementary school. However, I feel it is necessary to describe the basics of the basics to make sure that I'm not moving beyond what people are aware of. But now with that established, let's move beyond the comprehension of mean, median, and mode, as while these outputs can provide useful information about a data set, they alone are not enough to answer 
really any questions. Let's build off of our understanding, however, of the measures of central tendency to describe a range, which is easily calculated by taking the highest score in a data set and subtracting it from the lowest score in the same set. Let's say, for example, that I assess a series of tests of intelligence quotient scores. If my highest score is 160 and my lowest score is 60, then my range would be 100 from 60 to 160, so 100. For review, let's take a look at this raw data set. You can even use something as simple as MS Word to organize a set of numbers like this, this is a very small set of numbers, from largest to smallest, which makes it a bit easier to assess the descriptives visually. Again, I'm not going to teach you guys how to use SPSS or any kind of statistical program, so we're going to be dealing with very low number sets just for the sake of ease. Anyway, first let's assess and identify the number of cases, that is the n value, which in this instance is 6, as there are 6 integers in this set. Next, the median n mode, which are easy in this case, as both are 5, with 5 occurring both in the center of the data set and being the most frequently occurring numeral. Finally, the range is 9, given that there are 9 possible integers that are included in this small data set of 6 numbers between 1 and 10. Note that the range is not 10 because there is no 0 score. It's 1 to 10, therefore the range is 9. Now let's calculate the mean, which is simply the sum of x over n. That is, all of these integers added together, their sum that is represented by the Greek symbol sigma, and then divided by the number of cases. In this example, our mean is 5.16. Simple shit, right? Here's the basic mathematics. Now that we understand these most basics of basics, the mean, median, mode, and range, let's get into types of distributions, beginning with the oh-so-racist normal curve. The normal curve, also called a bell curve, and before you try to crucify Charles Murray for the term, is used by every single fucking scientist on the planet to describe a normal distribution, sorry fam, is the theoretical distribution of scores with a peak of the majority score in the middle. As such, either sides of the peak are described by few instances, either as lesser or greater than said peak. That is, the bell curve is weirdly bell-shaped, with an average toward the mean. Again, the mean being the average. That is, the majority of respondents tend to have more similar tendencies than they do dissimilar tendencies. Intelligence quotient, IQ, is of course one of the most commonly used examples to describe a bell curve. But there are all types of variables that exist on a bell curve when we look at humans, such as height, for example. Well, there will be some people who are extremely tall, or extremely short, the majority of people tend toward the mean, they tend toward the middle. Of course, you would want to measure men and women separately when you talk about height, but across one single sex, and yeah, there's only two, sorry about that one, you should find a clustering near the central mean. But particularly in the social sciences, we don't always find a normal curve or a normal distribution. For example, I don't really like chocolate. I actually don't really like many sweets unless they're very sour as well. That's kind of unusual, particularly for women, I would imagine, at least in terms of stereotypes. In contrast, however, most people like chocolate, most people like sweets, right? In a survey, if I have people rate on a scale of 1 to 10 how much they like sweets, if 1 represented not at all and 10 represented absolute adoration of sweets, I would guess that you would find a higher clustering of responses towards 10 than to 1. But my personal answer, my score would be a 1 or a 2. Does that mean I don't exist? Well, in some cases I'm sure feminists would certainly like to think that I don't, but I assure you I do. As such, we might find instead something called a skewed distribution rather than a normal curve. Unlike a bell curve, which is the basis of hypothesis testing, for example, skewed distributions lack a central tendency towards the middle, in that one side is not a relative mirror of the opposite side. But for large amount of data sets, we do find many distributions that tend toward a bell curve, towards a normal curve, for any number of variables, really, rather than a skewed distribution. Again, in the social sciences, this is a little bit different because people are often skewed, honestly. My chocolates and sweets example would yield a negatively skewed distribution, with more percentage of people expressing a preference for chocolate and with numbers more skewed towards 10 than the thin tail moving backwards towards answers of 1 or 2. Given that it's a freaking meme, I could also surmise that we would find an opposite distribution, a positively skewed distribution, if I asked people the same liquor type question of a preference towards liking pineapple pizza. I like pineapple pizza, by the way, go ahead and crucify me. 
me. Lots of people hate it though, so we would probably find a higher clustering towards the low scores than more positive scores going towards the right this time, as one last point about the skewing of a distribution. However, again, for many things such as intelligence quotient, we do find that they lie upon a normal curve. Next, we need to go a little bit deeper, because I see a lot of misunderstanding here, and that is in the conception of what the fresh fuck a standard deviation is. In its most basic description, a standard deviation is an indication of the variability in a data set. Standard deviation describes the extent and the variability from the mean of a data set. For example, a normal distribution with low skew towards the center and a wider curve indicates a wider distance between deviations. For example, in terms of intelligence quotient, once again, women tend to have a thinner curve. More women tend toward the mean. It's more rare and it's less likely for women to have extremely high or extremely low IQs. Dissimilarly, men have a much wider curve in that there are more stupid men and there are also far more intelligent men. This just describes differences in the standard deviation. Let me explain. The total range of scores in a data set are represented on the x-axis of a curve, that is the horizontal axis, while the frequency at which these scores occur are represented on the y-axis, the vertical axis. For a normal curve, for the theoretical normal curve, the mean difference between a standard deviation of negative 1 to positive 1 represents 68.26% of the numbers in the set. Again, this is the theoretical normal curve. Again, this is only the case in a completely normal distribution. So, why do we use the term normal curve? Why do we even give a shit about this? Well, simply put, because it's rather normal. Funny how terms of statistics tend to be somewhat straightforward, huh? Once again, analysis of many different types of variables indicates a tendency for values to aggregate near the mean, near the center, forming this iconic bell shape. Social scientists can use this normal tendency for values to gather around the mean as a method of testing inferential statistics to answer questions and draw conclusions about the relationships between numbers in a data set. In other words, to answer a hypothesis. That means that in a standard bell curve, 68.26% of all people fall within two standard deviations from the mean, one below and one above. If, for an example, the instance of IQ, you tend to fall below the mean of, which is about 100 in the United States for the average IQ score, that would mean that you still fall within half of the US population because half of the US population falls below 100 points on the IQ instrument. Half of the population, 50%. Ever think about how fucking stupid the average person is? Well, just remember that the normal curve, within the normal curve, that half of the population is even more stupid than the average, at least in terms of measuring through intelligence quotient, which by the way, here's what IQ is, motherfuckers. IQ is a measure of generalized intelligence. It is not a measure of all forms of intelligence, nor is it relegated to a single gene. IQ measures generalized intelligence. And what we find consistently with IQ is that it can be plugged into model fit, meaning that I can make predictives off of IQ. If you have a relatively high IQ, well, guess what? You are more likely, and it describes a certain amount of the variance in outcome, to be more successful in occupation and in education. That doesn't mean it's a determinant. It means that it explains a large amount of variance. I'm so tired of feeling like I have to explain this, because it should be obvious, but apparently it's not. God. Fucking damn it. Finding out you have a low IQ does not mean that you can't succeed. It doesn't mean you can't do great things. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you're not smart. It means that you don't meet some sort of criteria of what we call generalized intelligence. And while yes, there is definitively a racial component, a genetic, a hereditary component, it doesn't mean that if you're black, you're stupid. That is not how the normal curve works. And I hope, if nothing else, by the end of this video, you will understand the normal curve. I'm going off script here right now. Let's be honest. In terms of intelligence quotient, what we find consistently is that in the United States, African Americans tend to score about one standard deviation, I've described standard deviation, below white Americans. Who, by the way, white Americans tend to score about one standard deviation below Asian Americans. Do you know why I'm not upset about that? Because IQ is not a prescriptive. It's not a determinant. It doesn't mean that something about you is lesser or inferior. It is a single measure of intelligence. And if you understand how the normal curve works, it doesn't mean that people who are black cannot have an IQ of 160. There is nothing about the normal curve that describes that. Just as there is nothing 
talking about the normal curve that says that if you are an Asian man, you cannot be functionally retarded. I am providing this information in part because it's making me fucking irate. Oh, Hayden, calm down, calm down, calm down. Uh, give it again, give it again. Hey, hey guys, I'm back. Let's, uh, let's get back on point here, shall we? Let's get back to talking about standard deviation. If you fall below the 100 average IQ, you're below 100, it's still most likely within about 70% of the population, as long as you are within that 70%, so most likely, that you are still within one standard deviation from the mean. You're, you're still pretty close to the mean of IQ in the United States. In terms of the standard, the normal curve, one negative standard deviation from the mean of 100 ranges from 85 to 100, meaning that you would have to have an IQ of 85 or below to be outside of a standard deviation from the normative IQ distribution of the United States, as a disparate and as non-homogeneous of a nation as we are. Just as you would require an IQ of above 115 to be above one standard deviation from the mean. Again, this describes about 70% of the US population. Further, including a range of four standard deviations from the mean in the normal curve includes 95% of the population in IQ, with a range from 70 to 130. As we move more and more standard deviations away from the mean, the less and less population is accounted for in either direction. Expanding to six standard deviations, for example, now accounts for 99% of the population and includes an IQ range from 55 to 145. That last 1% 1% of the population are those with IQ scores that fall either below 55 or above 145, and they are included within eight standard deviations from the mean of 100. I must note one last time that IQ is but a single measure of generalized intelligence, and while it is associated with educational and occupational outcomes, it is not a determinant nor a limit of capacity for any individual to succeed in life. But there you have it. That's IQ. That's the normal curve distribution that everyone is telling you is so racist and terrible and awful and limiting. That's it. That's it. They're just averages. That's really all it is. And if it upsets you, <laughs> I, I don't know what else I could say at this point that would make it not upsetting. Because all I've described are statistics. Although apparently that's very racist and sexist according to Google. <laughs> God damn it. <sighs> How does the biggest tech company on earth not understand basic statistics? I don't. Don't ask me, apparently, because I can't answer that one. Okay, Aiden, you gotta calm this shit down. Hey, I know what we'll do to calm me down, lower my blood pressure a little bit. Let's for funsies calculate standard deviation from the mean based on an example data set I will provide, shall we? Just so any of you out there can understand how to calculate it if you want to, because, I don't know, you feel like spending an afternoon manually calculating a standard deviation for no reason other than I, I enjoy it. While there are generally two ways to calculate standard deviation, I'm only going to address what I believe to be the easier deviation score method. Here's the equation to calculate standard deviation. Is this looking a bit similar? If so, good on you. That's in part because the equation used to calculate the mean is in this equation. With standard deviation being the square root of the sum of x over n. Again, remember x is mean and n is the total number of values in the data set. The square root of all the scores added together, squared, divided by the number of cases in the set. First, we need to calculate the deviation score, which is each individual score for x minus the value for n. Then this set of scores is squared and added together to find the cumulative sum of the deviation score, or x squared. We can then simply plug our numbers into the equation for a standard deviation with the sum of x squared over n, which in this data set produces a sum of x squared of 90 and an n of 7. 90 divided by 7 is 12.86. Finally, resolve the square root for 12.86, which forwards the standard deviation for this data set as 3.59. As I mentioned, there is another method of doing this by hand, which is called the raw score method. But for now, let's just stick to this individual method of finding a standard deviation, since if for some reason you really find yourself in need of figuring any of this shit out, it can be done much more easily and quickly using a program like SPSS. But I do think it's valuable to understand how we come to these numerical values and explain how equations function. I think one of the reasons I struggled so much in math as a kid is because no one explained to me what an equation meant. There are just a few more things to describe when it comes to descriptives. 
Although I admit that explaining the normal curve was really the main reason I wanted to cover this topic first, or more accurately as the second episode in the series, just to get it out of my system. If you couldn't tell, I was a little bit pissed off. But hang on, there is a bit more. While so far the example I presented you with had a near non-extant end value of 6, by that I mean an end value of 6 is really not a lot of information to play around with, typically social science research is concerned with large data sets on which we can assess several types of descriptives without going into inferential statistics and testing, such as frequencies and percentages. Frequencies are merely counting the number of times something occurs in a data set. For example, let's go to the Twitter and uh, take a look at the number of tweets I've made since the start of June and look at the emojis I've posted most frequently. I use the thinking emoji 10 times, the crying laughing emoji 7 times, and the OK sign 5 times. As you can see, I favor the thinking emoji the most, but this counting of frequency alone can be easily expanded upon to understand the percentage of posts using emojis represented by dividing the individual frequency by the total sample size, the n, which in this case is 12 tweets. Of tweets that included any emoji, 83% included the thinking emoji, 58% included the crying laughing emoji, and 42% included the OK sign. If you notice that this certainly does not equal up to 100% evenly, good call. That's because some tweets included multiple emojis or one emoji multiple times. And that's about it for frequencies and percentages. Like with all descriptive statistics, they can help flesh out what a data set looks like. But they can't do much beyond that, beyond description, as the term descriptive statistics suggests. As such, in this case, you can see that I probably use that thinking emoji too fucking often. And uh, that's about it for descriptive statistics. For some reason I'm not super clear on, Keaton, the book that I'm referring to in these videos that if you are really enjoying, perhaps you should consider picking up into looking into statistics and social science research. Keaton also covers significance levels and hypothesis testing in this chapter, so I will mention one last thing about significance briefly before I close by just describing what significance level is. It is something I've described in various other videos, so maybe I should yeah, go into some detail on it. This is all a significance level is. It merely indicates the probability that if I collected a data set again, I would generally find the same results. There are all kinds of reasons why we might find different results from things as complex as the state of mind of an individual to something as seemingly innocuous and random as the time of day at which the data are collected, depending on the individual variable being assessed. Significance, which is also called the probability level, but most frequently referred to as an alpha level, which should not be confused with a Cronbach's alpha of internal consistency of instrumentation, merely indicates the likelihood that these data could be collected again in the same general manner. In social science research, typically an alpha level above 0.05, meaning that there is a probability above 5% that different results would be forwarded, are discarded and considered non-significant. That is, if there is a greater than 5% chance that I wouldn't be able to replicate a data set Set, then there is simply too much possibility for error that the data cannot be analyzed further. Now while this is a whole can of worms involving significance levels being used in place of strong correlations, which is one of the reasons why journals no longer even require significance levels be reported on or forwarded, just assuming an alpha of 0.05 or lower automatically, we do need to have statistically significant data before moving forward into inferential statistics. And uh, that's a good last point to end on, because we are from here on out moving into inferentials. Merely being able to say that your data aren't more than 5% likely to be the result of random error is all that the phrase statistically significant means. That's it. That everything you just reported on isn't a complete accident. So when you hear somebody say statistical significance, remember that. It just means this isn't totally random. That's all it is. And uh, I think that's all we need to cover for this shit. And you know what? With that being taken care of, I think my friends, that pretty much covers descriptive statistics with a little bit of a helping of significance on the top. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altanavolt.